Hi, I'm Hall Davidson. If you were part of the ASCD conference overflow on March 23rd, this recording is for you. So that means you're watching, as my friend Jan Hall likes to say, in the future. Uh, the advantage of this is you can hit the pause button and go back and, uh, and review. Uh, there is a huge doc, which we'll get to in a minute, which is also full of resources. This originally was 30 minutes. You might go a little bit longer now because we can, but this is intended uh, as a repeat of the artificial intelligence session from the ASCD conference in Washington, DC on March 23rd. Today is March 27th. So I'm gonna share my screen and we'll go into the very deck that I used back then. Uh, again, if you have any questions, I'm, at, I'm Holt Davidson at hdavidson at discoveryed.com. All right, so here we go. And this was the title, Generative AI, Power, Policy, Potential, and Career Pathways. And you can see that's a lot of material to cover, which is why I built this doc uh, that's the handout that we'll get to in a minute. Uh, you'll see that there's a lot of deep resources there about the power of AI, the policy building required by AI in schools, the potential for it, and then some career pathways at the end, uh, which we have built. Uh, they're free, and we hope you enjoy those. Now, this is the first slide we use, and you can see that there's a photo needed here of me because I like to have a photo of you at the conferences. And, you know, so I said, uh, I'll have, uh, because I'm, you know, old and was really before photography, uh, I thought I'd have AI generate a uh, picture for me. So I wanted a prompt of an AI of a Jedi warrior like Obi-Wan in photorealistic style. And I uploaded a picture of myself and turned myself into a Jedi warrior. And here are the four uh, Jedi warrior screens that you can see. It gave me a choice. Dolly gives you a choice of four. Then you can click on one and follow up. And I'd like you, uh, if you have a pen or just if you have a hand, to tell me which of these you think I should have used at the conference. One, two, three, or four. Which one of these should I have used at the conference? Uh, you also see my bio there. Uh, and you see, I, I started talking about artificial intelligence and AI about seven years ago. So everybody seems to be talking about it now. I was talking about it seven years ago. And those handouts are online somewhere. You can find those too. Uh, this is, um, sorry about that, This these are the handouts. There's a QR code for you and also a tiny URL, tinyurl.com AIASCD24. Built those with my own hands. So you can use those if you'd like to download a really rich group of, uh, of documents. All right, so what do you think? One, two, three, or four. Now you're doing this in the future, but I'm sensing you're picking three. That's what I think you're picking. So let's see. And that's the one that I'll use, uh, the three, uh, to start off this presentation. So thank you. And again, that's the use of generative AI. Now, what's interesting is that generative AI uh, can change overnight. And that's what happened with Dali. You can no longer upload a picture and create a, a a, a new persona or a background or have fun with yourself uh, the way that I did. Uh, thank you, uh, probably some students in Beverly Hills for that. Uh, but also other things were happening with uploaded pictures. So uh, that can't happen. And that that's one of the indications that you've got really an updatable ability with artificial intelligence because they're generated with the models that they have online, their large, large language models are online and they can change the way that they work anytime. So that's a thing to remember. Uh, looking for and again, that's the prompt. So the prompt we're going to talk about to get that picture is really uh, critically important. Uh, why are we doing this? Discovery Education does not have a product of AI that it sells. Uh, we use AI in our product and more about that uh, to come in the next school year. But this is the reason why, because we believe we should support educators and grow the student. AI is an incredibly powerful tool to support educators in what they do and to help grow student ability to do art, essays, analysis, coding, and lots of other stuff. So that's why we're doing it. And that's why this is posted online for you uh, at no charge. So here's uh, here's the person, Eileen Cannon, the great Eileen Cannon, who did the session just before me. And because uh, I had my picture done and modified, I asked her if she'd like to do it. And she said, here's what I'd like to be. Because remember, it's the prompt. Uh, that could convert her into these things. An Amazon princess, nurturing curiosity and supporting future generations and different cultures with wonder and awe with my dog, Wonder. Now, as I said, when I tried this, I found out that Dali does not do that anymore. 
And here's, this is what the picture that it gave me, which looks nothing like Eileen and nothing like the dog. I get the Amazon princess part, but this is not what I wanted. It was a cartoonish kind of model. So I talked to Dolly and said, this is all of my conversation in the dialogue, you used to be able to transform personal images. That changes. And it told me, well, yes, it has. We can't do that anymore. So I thought, hmm, maybe I could do it with the dog. I can't do it with the person. And it said, yeah, you can upload a picture of dog. Now it won't theoretically use the dog. It'll look at the dog, describe the dog to itself, and then create a picture. So that's what I did. And here's the prompt. And there's the dog, Wonder. The prompt was make the dog a superheroine with an overly patriotic red, white, and blue outfit. You can see that with a W on a costume. So that's the, uh, the wonder dog. I couldn't do Eileen the person. So I had to manipulate the prompt to get something that would work in a different way. Is this a skill that would serve students? I really think it is. I really think you're working with like an assistant. Then you have to learn how the assistant thinks and you do what you want to do. Uh, then I thought, well, let's, let's go all the way to do what Eileen wanted and let's make her inspiring people. So I said, how about a superhero and a patriotic et cetera, with a flowing cape and a W on her chest. And it gave me a great picture with an S on the chest. So I, I in the dialogue, I said, hey, that's a W. Uh, that's not S, not a W. So give me a, a picture with W. Inspiring children from 8 to 18. So it, it did correct the, uh, the W, which was great. And then there is inspiring children, but it doesn't look inspiring. Children 8 to 18, yes, but the dog is in front of them. So I had to say, the dog is facing us and the children are facing the dog. And then I, I got that picture. And that's a pretty good one for what we wanted. Uh, a, uh, a dog inspiring children uh, like a superhero. But you see that I had to work on the prompts to get exactly what I want, which is the kind of skill we're talking about. If you're a teacher and you're building a lesson, it's sort of the same thing. Uh, if you haven't specified the kind of students that you have, uh, because you see them every day and you take it for granted, you have to tell the generative AI that when you're building something for them. Anyway, here's kind of a fun one again. Um, every president as a US, every US president is a Pixar character. So again, the prompt has given me a visual style for, uh, for the presidents. And it, I said no positive or negative prompts because you don't want them to, to take what's out on the web or the sources that they do and, and maybe give you a negative. So I specified that, but that's kind of fun. Uh, could I uh, ask for Teddy Roosevelt as a trust buster? Uh, probably. Uh, again, AIs can change what they do overnight, but the prompt is what we do. So originally, what I usually do for a picture is I say, this is a picture of me from my first faculty yearbook, uh, because that's how old I am. But, uh, and thank you, State Teachers Retirement System, where I was for 30 years. Thank you. Uh, but you see here, in asking for the prompt, I have a noun, I have adjectives, I have a visual medium style. Would it benefit students to know that these are the, the things that AI recognize? Yes, I think so. And when I generated it, it gave me those four pictures. But look at this one. This, this looks nothing like an ancient Babylonian mosaic. So that's what we can call a hallucination. And you do have to check things and, uh, and see how they go, but that's, that's uh, what can happen. So it's not entirely uh, without human direction. Here's again what you can do with prompts. And this is probably two weeks old, maybe three weeks old, the time I'm taping this. Here's a prompt. Camera faces colorful buildings. You can see it in Burano, Italy. An adorable Dalmatian looks through a window on the building of the ground floor, etc. So it gave the picture to Sora. Sora gave this picture. And the picture is, you know, beautiful. It's colorful. People like this picture. What's amazing about this prompt is this is not a prompt to go into a picture. This is a prompt that goes into a video. And here's what the video looks like. So it's pretty amazing. This is not a photograph. This is not done with a camera. This is all completely generated by the AI. And there's lots more examples in the handout of this, but you can see that knowing how to build a prompt is a skill that's going to go very, very far. Okay, so um, let's go to the next slide, Mr. Davidson. Uh, here's another one. This is historical footage of California during the gold rush, except it's not really footage. It's generated by the AI. So what will happen? Are we going to be able to do is have a lot more visual tools, both to do teaching with and for students to do, uh, demonstrate learning with? Yes. And again, some of the errors, some of the images in here may be wrong. I don't see any that are wrong, but some might be. And that's the kind of 
um, media literacy that you want students to be able to do to go and look. So there, that SOAR, which is also part of um, of the open AI, which is ChatGBT and Dolly. So let, let's look at a teacher's way to use a prompt in a good way. I wanted a reading list working with librarians uh, uh, at, at a workshop, a uh, reading list of sixth grade female student with, uh, should have been students, with a Lexile reading measure of 600 and whose home language is Spanish and whose heritage is Mexican-American. So when I did that as a prompt, I got this uh, reading list, which is kind of cool. Uh, and that's good. And again, that's the kind of thing it could do. If you ask for it in Spanish, it would give it to you in Spanish. That's chat GBT3. Here's Bard. Bard is Google's uh, AI. And Bard has, they're all a little different. Barb has some advantages, Bard does. So I asked Bard for a sixth grade male reading list, uh, Lexile reading measure, about 600 and whose language is Armenian and Heritage is Armenian. I taught in Los Angeles, and I had a, a many students that had Armenian heritage, and it gave me this as the uh, as the reading list. So there's some in Armenian language, and here's uh, some that are in English. Uh, the good thing about Bard, a nice thing, is that at the bottom of the page, you can see it there. After the AI gives you a result, there's a little box, and you can click on the G there, and the G will take everything it gave you and send it out to the web and Google it. In other words, it does a check of its own information. So that would cut down on the uh, hallucinations that you can have. So that's a, a pretty cool thing. Uh, again, what, what it will do is it will give you the same, it will give you the same search, but it'll color code it. The green stuff means that it's probably right. The pink stuff means it's probably not what you're looking for. So you can see that Bard kind of corrected itself and said, maybe these stories are not really about uh, Armenians. And if you look at Moses, Man of the Nile, uh, is it really a book about um, that would be interested in Armenian history? I don't think so. Uh, and neither did the web. So that's how it is. That, that's what Bard is. So they can all make a difference. Here's a, again, this is chat GBT4. Uh, and ChatGPT4, you do have to pay for. I think it's twenty dollars a month. And I held out for this because I like to talk about stuff that's free, 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 free. Uh, but I was in a workshop with a teacher, and he had paid for uh, ChatGPT4 and used it really well. So I said, "Okay, if you're going to do it, I'm going to do it too." Anyway, so this is GBT4. That meant I could upload a photo. So I uploaded a photo. This is my daughter's old photo, of, uh, uh, old uh, illustration for her paper on uh, cellular respiration when she was in middle school. So I said to, to the AI, ChatGPT4, as a teacher, evaluate this student drawing and write a supportive evaluation. Uh, by the way, do it in Spanish, and it's intended for the girl's parents. So it did that. Uh, here's what it gave me, a really long thing. And Spanish is my second language, not as good as it used to be, but this is a pretty good little letter, I think. You can check it out yourself in the, uh, in the handouts because this whole presentation is also uh, saved as a PDF in the uh in the handout but this is too long no no parent's going to read that so i said make it the same comment but only briefer so here it is again it's about a paragraph quiero felicitar i am a what's weird is uh and spooky is that my daughter's name is emma but i didn't tell it that it just somehow used emma as an example so that's interesting uh it, it also thinks my name is mark for some reason not sure why anyway uh write the same comments to the parents but using the California state standards. I don't know if a parent would care about the standards. I just want to see if he could do it. And sure enough, it did. It highlights uh, the appropriate California state standards. Uh, we live in California uh, for that drawing of cellular respiration. So good grief. So prompts are really important. And one of the things you can do if you're an administrator uh, is, or even a resource teacher, build a library of prompts. So this is from uh, Joe Marquez, who works in Q. I was on the board of Q. Joe and I have done AI presentations together. It was fun. But look at the list. And, and the link to this Padlet is in, uh, in the handout. But there's prompts to write music. There's prompts to do a biology lesson. Uh, there's a, a super prompt, which basically turns the AI into a tutor. Uh, it's pretty cool. So what you do is copy and like if you want to uh, uh, Eli's prompt, you copy it, paste it from this Padlet, go to chat GPT, for example, could, could try it with Bard, 
and then you paste this in there. So you don't have to do all that writing. With, with prompts, the longer, the better. So this prompt would be um, would be there for you to use. And we also, stories, comments, and other stuff. This link you can look at more in Padlet if you want. But but it's, I think it's pretty cool. Here's, uh, I was referencing the teacher who used ChatGPT4. Uh, here it is, uh, uh, David Ross. And you see that he's, th this uh, is his Google Doc, and there's a link to it in the handouts. But he has some fun stuff. Uh you know, explain how the supply chains for U.S. grocery stores work. Assume that I am Genghis Khan. That's kind of a fun prompt, too, because you're you're telling the AI assistant who you are. You're giving yourself a persona. Uh, you can also give it a persona. You know, you're a friendly tutor or I can be Genghis Khan. Anyway, so that's kind of fun. So prompts are really important to understanding AI. Now, we, we can't spend a lot of time on this, but uh, one of the things that I like to talk about is using AI to use AI. How do you do that? You build a prompt that tells the AI to become your prompt generator. So this is in the handout. If you copy and paste this into your prompt, into ChatGBT, uh, this is kind of fun, then it will help you make a great prompt for whatever, whatever it is you're trying to do. It, it, you, you tell it this, then you give it a prompt and it looks at the prompt and goes, hey, you need more stuff. Uh, and so then you build a new prompt and then it does it again. And you do this until you tell it to stop. So that's what you do. You copy and paste it and put it into uh, into ChatGPT and then give it whatever prompt you want. Lesson plans, history, uh, imaginative stuff. That's that's how you do it. All right. So we're going to, um, that's the section on, on the nuts and bolts of AI. And obviously that's quick. If you want us to do more of this, just contact the person that you use, your point of contact for discovery education. It's discoveryeducation.com. Uh, AI, now we're going to go into policy a little bit. AI is a tool. And like all tools, these are tools up here. I'm old enough that I had, you know, shop class, which is, I thought, invaluable and really cool. But all these tools require policy. I mean, they were, you know, we used drill presses and, you know, circular saws. So all those, you know, had downsides. They were dangerous. So there were policies and procedures and guardrails for all those kind of things. And that's what you want for AI. Uh, to me, let's get some things out of the way. It's not a question of whether students should use it. Um, there's a debate about this. It's going to be a very fast debate. Uh, I was teaching math back in the, I mean, when calculators came in, not the fancy calculators, the four function calculators. And there was a huge debate in the math community whether or not they should be used. Can you use these? Some people said, nope. Uh, we cover up the the uh, times tables in our classrooms because kids are supposed to internalize this, which is why Socrates didn't like writing because kids could just read stuff. Students could just read stuff and not have to memorize it. Anyway, there's always these debates. There's no question that students should use it. In my opinion, it's like a calculator. Are you going to let other kids learn how to use a calculator and, and your kids don't? So the real issue is going to be which one of the two calculators, which one of the two AI tools are we going to let them use? Are we going to have one in the school that has the premium features, the good stuff. Um, you know, the free stuff is pretty good too and a great place to start, but what are we going to do? So th those are decisions that need to be made. It's not a question, by the way, of can students use it? Uh, I'm the this year the executive director of the California Student Media Festival. Uh, it's now 58 years old, but four years ago, in 2020, we had our first artificial intelligence award for student use. That's four years ago. Uh, it was a great great use. Kids built uh, an AI chatbot uh, for themselves to help them uh, transition into middle school. They were, you know, elementary kids. They were a little nervous, so they built a, a, a chatbot that really helped them. Uh, they used Python, used coding language. It was a lot harder four years ago to build those kind of uh, chatbots, but they did it. And the link to that, if you want to see the whole project, is in, guess where? The handout. Okay, good. Uh, and it's not even really in talking about policy, should kids use stuff generated by another source? And the answer is, we've always told them that. Uh, I almost didn't get out of high school because I, I did a, <laughs> uh, a late research paper. Research papers meant you went to the, uh, went to the library, number of libraries, and you pulled out uh, cite, uh, great quotes, citations to build an argument. So we've been telling kids to use other people's work for a very long time. The question is always, how do you cite it? So here's the MLA site. Uh, they have the citation, had for a long time, the uh, the way to use AI. The, the example here is the Great Gatsby. A kid used uh, ChatGBT 
to help write an essay on the Great Gatsby. And he just cited it. He said, yep, I used it. I cited it. If he'd done uh, some analysis from Ezra Pound, he could cite that. And we'd say, oh, that's so great. Same thing for the use of AI. To use it well uh, is a skill, like a research paper was a skill. And we can do that. All right, so that's it. Here's a, an easier way to do a... Um, a citation. Uh, this is just three different ways. One, it's made by a human, modified by an AI. It's made by an AI, modified, excuse me, made by human, modified by an AI, or it's made by an AI. So these are three little badges. The link to that, it's called AI Attribution is the site. I, I don't know if I love these images, but the idea of doing a little badge at the bottom, you just go, yep, an AI was in here and I, I helped do it. Or it's all AI. Like if I was doing one of those images, I mean, it generated it. I did help with the prompt. It did what I told it to do. But those are the three things. By a person, by an AI, uh, either modified or um, uh, just by an AI. So let throw those at the bottom of a paper. Then we'll know. Um, and maybe we'll get to the point where uh, teachers will throw those at the bottom of the lesson. Or maybe when you write uh, a letter home or a um, recommendation letter for somebody's job, you'll put it on there. Unlikely at this point in time, but uh, maybe we'll get to know that. So you have to build a policy. Uh, there's three ways to build policies. And I think the first people you should, it's not three ways, there's three places where they can apply, uh, a district, a building, and then acceptable use policies at the individual level for both teachers and students. If you build a policy, why not start with the student voices? And these are, uh, I spent days at, right before I came to ASCD at the uh, Digital Promises League of Innovative Schools convening. And that was about, uh, they spent days on artificial intelligence. And uh, just a couple of notes is one person that had, had been talking about, it's from Laguna Beach. Um, this was actually outside the conference. Uh, here's what students were saying. Uh, if I know about it, AI, and I use it, and my friends don't, is that fair that I use this great tool and they don't? What about if my teachers use it, to build great lessons or to do tutorials for me at home. They build those for me. And other kids, teachers are doing are not doing that. Is that fair? So fairness, equity, those are things that, at least in that district, middle school kids cared about. If you want a district policy, and again, this is all being formed. These are just starters to, to get you started. Uh, but form a task force, uh, teachers, principals, and why not ask students? Um, I'd say I'd say parents for later, but you may want to include parents in your task force too. Anyway, listen to voices on the ground. People are already using it. Kids are already using it. Find out how they're using it and uh, let the policy reflect actual use. Uh, and I'd say start recognizing that AI is a power for good and move away from, ah, this is all cheating. Give us tools who can tell if kids are using this or not. You know, did we have tools to let them know they were using calculators or uh, tutors uh, or the library. Uh, no, we didn't We didn't care as long as the results were what we wanted. And it felt like a kid had internalized it. Uh, and if kids internalize prompting, anyway, it's a whole different uh, thought. But in my humble opinion, focus on the good it can do in policy and not on just rules, rules, rules and why you can't do it. And because kids will cheat, Get, let's grow out of that. Anyway, you also wanna build an acceptable use policy for students and teachers. And you want, this is uh, one of the things administrators said at the league, uh, build a response policy, be ready because things are gonna happen, build a policy that you know, so you know what to do when it happened. Uh, recently, uh, uh, some, some unfortunate uses of AI were done at a school uh, they were in the news and it took a fairly long time for them to expel those students. And it was, you know, exp expulsion is a very serious thing uh, and it should take days to think about, but there was no policy in place at the time. If you have a policy that says students will be automatically suspended, uh, you know, pending expulsion or something like that. Anyway, it will help save you. So build a response policy and why not let an AI take the sort of draft on your policy? There's a, um, an AI crafting of an AUP that I have in the handout. Actually, it's not in there, it's a small, I'll put that in before you get there. Anyway, the and other things, what's the purpose? This is again from the administrative panels at the league. What's the purpose? What's the ethics? What are the, what's the safety, FERPA and COPA? You know, the impacts, uh, the efficacy, the policy. And they said, you know, vendors should 
uh, that are using AI uh, should sign privacy agreements and you know, make sure they don't violate student policies. And I can tell you from the vendor side, that's a very big deal for everybody. Nobody wants to violate the policy restrictions. It sometimes gets in the way of building what we think is an effective product, but uh, I don't know anybody that would have trouble signing a privacy policy, but build one. It'll make the parents feel better. The other thing is get examples of useful data. I thought this was fun. A department, uh, this was Laguna again, uh, they had the IT department uh, check the IT department, check how often they went to the chat GPT site or other artificial intelligence sites. And, you know, as the year went on, staff use went up more than doubled, student use went up four times. You know, it's interesting to, to get some data on how much it's being used because it will be used a lot. Uh, anyway, a building policy What uh, uh, for the school, right? Building a policy for the school. That's the old middle school where I taught, by the way. They painted the doors blue. I have no idea why. And those kids are all kids that have submitted projects to the California Student Media Festival. And they signed releases. So there you go. Um, the policy, you want teacher use. How can teachers use it? Uh, do a little survey. How many teachers are on board? Some are absolutely opposed to it. Uh so that's got to be reflected in the, in the policy, depending on your, your teacher population and your student population. Uh, and what way should we encourage, teach, encourage teachers to use it? Hey, we'd really like you to try using it here, here, and here. That's moving uh, uh, the usage forward. Prompt library, why not have a prompt library form? Uh, and maybe there's one station that has a premium log login. You know, ChatGPT4 is on, they license it by machine. So it's over here and we can all uh, use it when we if we line up for it. Anyway, set aside some orientation time, stuff like that. Student use, same thing, but how can students use it? Make sure they know about attribution and shared voices. What, what, what do they have to say about it? And give them some models. So this, this is just to get things started. Uh, even at the, at the session, the 30-minute session at ASCD, we didn't go in here deep, but people uh, seem to be very interested in this. So I, I'm assuming you will be too. I did draft a, uh, I remember I've been talking about this for seven years and in the old days, seven years ago, old days, uh, it meant using Alexa in a classroom or uh, a, a Google a Google product in the classroom. Now it's really the, the AI, the generative AIs and stuff. So here's a draft letter uh, that you can have the parents sign. I think parents should sign off. Uh, again, I don't know if people are doing that yet, but they will be doing it so you can get ahead of the game. Uh, this is a draft that I did myself. Uh, this was not done by an AI. But I would, if I was doing it again, uh, not seven years ago, I would uh, would have AI do the first draft. But it, again, this is draft, draft, draft. I'm not a lawyer. Have your lawyers look at it. But you do want to let let parents know. I think again, it's up to you whether you want to or not. It's in the handout. Okay, so that was all, was all the time we had for both the nuts and bolts of of AI, the power of AI, and the policy part. And uh, some people were interested in the career pathways, some were not. Uh, we're going to talk about the career pathways. So you can go back and review the rest if you'd like, if you're watching it, as Jen said, from the future. But I think these are important. I think career pathways are important for kids for a lot of reasons. We did a whole session on career choices at the, at the conference and all the material that we've gathered with partners, 75 uh, corporate and foundation partners who believe that kids can't be what they can't see. So they've created these video profiles from working professionals that are passionate about their job to help kids get excited. And these are everything from, you know, truck drivers to, uh, to PhDs. Uh, there's a, a lot of stuff going on, but these are specifically in the handout, the ones specifically about AI careers. So a big gateway to all this stuff is the STEM Careers Coalition site. That's in the handout, uh, STEM Careers Coalition. Uh, and in there, you can you go to the home page. You'll see STEM career videos, which is pretty cool. And here, I just pulled some out: the AI researcher, the data scientist, the security engineer. So if you click on these, let's look at the AI researcher. Uh, you not only have a video of say, her saying why she loves what she does, but you've got student activations, uh, career profiles. Kids always want to know what. How much money do you make? You know, they also want to know what kind of car you drive. Uh, that was at least my middle school kids. So those questions, not the car question, but those questions are answered in the career profile. So do they, what are the student activation? Is kids really like it? 
You, th you think they're going to like it? You think you're going to like this or not? And then the career profile. This is a, just a sample of the video. I'm just going to play a second of this because it's in the handout and you can watch it. You might think that because AI systems are learning through algorithms, they should not have any biases and bias should only happen in human decision making. Anyway, so there you have a professional talking about bias. I think it's it's pretty interesting. Uh, again, the handout will will have those the direct link to that videos. Again, a short video, probably three four minutes long. Uh, good exposure for kids. Here's another resource: Girls for Tech. This is our collaboration with Mastercard. Again, this like the other ones are all free. Distribute classroom resources, family resources, lots of other stuff. These are the things that came up in AI and AI for social good activity. There's a a storm, where do you send the ambulances and the trucks and the repair crews? Where's the most important places? And if you have that set ahead of time, you have an algorithm you feed to an AI, it'll help give you the, the answers. So that's one of them. These are career profiles. Girls for Tech is, is uh, designed to let girls know that there are computer science jobs for them, including AI, which is a branch of computer science. Uh, these are those, but I think, uh, I mean, as, as a guy, I thought, uh, these were pretty cool little videos too. And again, here's a video. This is uh, Jasmine Torres. She's a vulnerability analyst. And I, I really like what she had to say. Uh, you, this is captioned in other languages. So uh, caption it as you, you know, watch it with kids that you want. I pulled up the Spanish uh, translation, but here's a little bit of the English for you. Cybersecurity is so important because it really affects everybody's lives. Say, for example, you're just sitting there playing your video games and all of a sudden, boom, it shuts down. Could have been that somebody got in there and manipulated your data and all of a sudden now you can't play your video games anymore. Hi, I'm Jasmine Torres. I'm a vulnerability analyst here at MasterCard. So vulnerability analysts will actually scan the network and we do this on a global scale. So the scanner will reach into the systems and look and see if there are vulnerabilities inside. Cybersecurity is really cool because you're talking to people all around the world. You know, not only are you talking to these people, most of the times you can actually go. You'll go visit different countries and, you know, share different experiences. I just want young women to know that it's really important to give this field a chance. You know, it may seem scary and may seem daunting and like, oh, that's I don't know enough stuff about technology. You don't need to know everything. If you just believe in yourself and you're willing to challenge yourself, you can do anything that you want and you can be anything that you want. And at the end of the day, you're doing something really cool. You're protecting people. You are that superhero. You're that person that is protecting the world. Well, isn't that cool? I mean, I just love the fact that uh, mm -hmm. you've got somebody passionate who who wants to talk about it. And that's, again, a, a short video. Uh, put the link online, let kids watch with their families, have a career day, whatever you want to do. Again, there's some also some supports, including a PowerPoint presentation, just in case you don't know a lot about uh, cybersecurity. Uh, here's a PowerPoint that kind of <laughs> will let you introduce it to a class or let, it, let a kid uh, do a presentation on it for a class. So those are career pathways that are part of what we do. All of it comes out. Not all of those are folded into the STEM Careers Coalition, but there's more than uh, than you'd ever need, I think, in the STEM Careers Coalition. So you have to get a case of Red Bull, go to STEM Careers Coalition, sit down with a team and go through and find the stuff that you think most work to open the eyes of your kids with careers that otherwise they won't see. So I'm passionate about sharing careers and hopefully you had a good time with there. Again, STEM resources, a uh, lot of good stuff in there. Uh, if you go to uh, the link, this is one of the links in the handout, uh, Women and Technology. Again, this is a site where kids can make notes if they want to, uh, although it's better if they make it on paper. Uh, if you click on, in my opinion, in, uh, if you click on computer science, again, you're led to the head of AI development and you can have an AI uh, uh, you can have a a video of the head of AI development who happens to be a woman in this case. So that's uh, some of the career resources that are there. Uh, please look at those and hopefully you can share. And again, there's just so many of them. I show a lot of these people in workshops say, you're just showing off now, which is true. 
anyway, th there's the other stuff. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on some of the other AI products because we are certainly past our 30 minute mark. But thank you for staying with me uh, again. Uh, go back, look and uh, find the resources. Uh, remember that the uh, the whole presentation is online as a uh, as a handout or in, you've got this video, too. This these are the handouts there's a qr code for you and also a tiny url tinyurl.com aiafcd24 built those with my own hand anyway that's it that's uh from me and from wonder the superhero dog anyway thanks very much thanks for spending another half hour with me and i'm sorry if you couldn't get in to the session at ASCD. we really did turn away a lot of people uh thank you very much again i'm paul davidson uh for discovery education you can reach me at h davidson at discoveryed.com.